I'm David Wessel. I'm director of the Hutchins Center on Monetary Policy here at Brookings. Uh, our mission is to improve the quality of fiscal and monetary policies, broadly defined, uh, and public understanding of them. And we got interested in the blockchain and distributed ledger because it seemed to be at a stage where it was presenting potential policy issues that need to be addressed uh, even if they're not going to be resolved soon, and that con conversations about Bitcoin seem to me have fallen into two distinct categories. One is the people who say it's either a fad or a fraud, and uh, all the fascinating stories about Silk Road and, uh, and stuff like that, uh, which does make for gripping uh, newspaper stories. I can understand why that's done. Uh, and then there's a second category of conversation, which involves many of the people in this room, which uh, reminds me of what it must have been like when the people at Netscape were trying to explain to their next-door neighbors what a browser was, <laughs> and having people roll their eyes and thinking, like, uh, I'm glad that guy isn't marrying my daughter because he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but that if, if we've learned anything since uh, 1993, 1994, when Netscape came along, it's that uh, things can really have an enormous impact on the way the economy functions, on the way policymakers uh, manage their respective jurisdictions, and that it can happen, in our time at least, a lot faster than many people expect. And so I, our goal today is uh, twofold. One is to uh, raise the uh, to better understand the technology and the policy issues that will determine whether this is an, a, a technology that uh, matures into one that can have huge benefits to the economy, to individuals, to businesses, uh, as the Internet has, or whether it will be um, somewhere between strangled in its crib by vested interests or will present such big challenges to the, or to the order of our society, whether it's financial or law enforcement, that we, we, it, get, it, gets, um, uh, it gets buried maybe for good reason. And so I think we're at this point where there is, are lots of conversations, but many of them are, uh, lack the translation between policymaker and technology. And so this morning, uh, and I'll talk about Seth Roll in a minute, this morning what we want to do is really have a discussion. There are people here from, uh, who have been in the industry, there are people here who have been in the, in the financial services business. There are some people here uh, who work for the government who will be free to speak. There are some people who are coming or who will be watching online who told me they're really interested, but their agency wouldn't let them open their mouth about this subject. Actually, a surprising number of people who have told me that. Um, I had a, a half-hour conversation with Sarah Raskin, the Deputy Treasury Secretary, explaining to me why she really wanted to come and talk, but she wasn't and couldn't. <laughs> um, and so the, the rules are very simple. This morning we'll have a roundtable. I've asked a couple of people to kick off. We're going to talk uh, first about the technology itself and how might it transform financial services, what to look for over the next 18 to 24 months. It'll tell us which way it's going. Um, after a break, we're going to turn to policy questions. What are the key questions that policymakers have to address? When, who, uh, what are the challenges? Um, uh, I've asked... Uh, a couple of people to help us kick off with brief framing conversations. This is going to be a really open conversation. You can use the standard raise your table tent. I'll call on you. Uh, use the mic. Hold it close to your mouth because it's uh, easier for people to hear. As I noted in, our, um, in the announcement, this is on the record, and it is being webcast, so uh, be forewarned. Um, and I want to make one other uh, point. Um, so this event is 100% funded by the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy of Brookings. Uh, there are people here from the industry. We w invited them. There are people here who may or may not have invested in the industry. We invited them. There are people here from the government who may, uh, who may speak but are not speaking for their agencies unless they indicate they are. Um, uh, I, I think it's important to have a neutral ground to have these conversations. We have no view on whether you need to have Bitcoin to have a distributed ledger work or you don't. 
Uh, we don't have any view on what the, whether it should be the CFTC or the CFPB that monitors this. Uh, we really do want to provide a forum. Uh, and I think it's important to note that, uh, just for the record. Now, um, Glenn Hutchins, who gave the money for the Hutchins Center, may or may not have investments in Bitcoin-related things. I really don't know, and I don't intend to find out. Um, nobody here is in the industry has, told, has dictated the agenda or vetoed or approved speakers, and that goes for Glenn, too. Glenn will be here around 10 o'clock, so I'll make that clear. Um, this uh, day got started, really, with conversations between Seth Wheeler and me. Uh, Seth, of course, as you know, was at the White House, the Fed, and the Treasury, and has been... Um, uh, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you've been doing here, Glenn. He's been, ha he's been hanging out here, Seth, um, uh, uh, further honing his um, embryonic networking skills <coughs> from a new perch. Um, uh, Seth has been very helpful in helping me think through who should be invited to this and who should and how we might organize the day. Um, Seth, as some of you may know, is uh, soon to go to the private sector. Um, uh, the company for which he's working is not represented here today, and when he opens his mouth, he will not be speaking for that uh, entity. And uh, I've encouraged him to open his mouth. I'm not sure it'll take a lot of encouragement. Uh, uh, but I want to thank him for helping us think through something that is really outside the lanes of what we usually think about in fiscal and monetary policy, but I'm convinced is really important and that the kind of conversations that will go on today and at similar events uh, will shape, have a big impact on whether this turns out to be a happy ending or a not happy ending. Uh, we'll have two sessions of about uh, an hour and 15 minutes here each this morning with a break in the middle. We'll have lunch in the room across the hall. You can go get your lunch and bring it back here. Uh, at 1 o'clock or 1.15, we'll move to the auditorium next door where that will be a much more conventional event with a stage, and we hope there that people will... Um, uh, uh, to educate a broader set of people. Uh, I think what I'll start is by just going around the room before you turn to the first section and letting people identify themselves and, uh, and maybe what is it that, what is your connection to bring you to, to this event? Uh, do you want to start? You have to push the button to speak. That makes sense. And <laughs> Hi there. I'm Perry M. Boring, the president and the founder of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Uh, we're the only trade association in Washington, D.C. that's representing the blockchain digital asset industry. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, for being here today and for Brookings for sponsoring this event. Uh, good morning. Matt Rozak with Tally Capital. I'm an investor in the Bitcoin and blockchain ecosystem, and uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, Sai Srinivasan from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, there are people who are trying to launch derivative instruments on uh, bitcoins, uh, and we are also market regulator and uh, really interested in uh, sort of blockchain technology and how it's being adapted for the uh, the derivatives marketplace. And if I may give a pitch to something we are doing. On Jan 26th, we are having a technology advisory committee uh, of the CFTC. Uh, and there are three panel sessions, and the third session is going to be talking about blockchains in the context of uh, derivatives markets. Thanks. Uh, and I'm Stephen Pear, the co-founder and CEO of a company called BitPay. Uh, we were founded in 2011. Uh, we're the, one of the oldest Bitcoin companies, uh, but we're also the largest payment processor uh, for Bitcoin payments. Hi, I'm Brad Peterson. I run global technology for NASDAQ. So we have a number of projects underway, some of which um, we've you know, talked about publicly, and um, I can, um, I'm can i here to share some of our experiences of you know where we're thinking about using blockchain um, in our products. And uh, from background, um, I've been at NASDAQ for about three years, but have uh, previously worked in telecommunications, financial services, and e-commerce. I was with eBay when... Um, we owned PayPal and Skype. So at that moment, I was in e-commerce, financial services, and telecom. Um, so, uh, so the interesting thing, though, that I that I see that's very familiar in in this whole technology stack is you know the peer the use of peer to peer, the use of cryptography, and um, I think the very creative use of proof of work. So I think the the innovation that is that is here is um, is worth studying and is is quite impressive and 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 creative. So um, so that 
that has inspired, I think, um, a lot of us to be here today. And uh, I, I look forward to the discussion. Hi, Barry Silbert, founder and CEO of Digital Currency Group, where we are an active business builder and investor in the space. Uh, Michael Barr from the University of Michigan Law School. I'm also a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings. Uh, I'm an advisor to Ripple Labs, and I served for uh, two years as the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Institutions. Uh, Charlie Cooper uh, from a firm called R3 CEV, which is a uh, distributed ledger startup out of New York. Um, my prior career was split between the private sector and banking and briefly at a law firm and uh, several stints down here in Washington on the government side. So thanks for having me. Meltem Demers. I'm also with Digital Currency Group, and I work with our portfolio of 60 companies. So we've made investments in companies at early stages and now watching them develop. So very interested in helping them think about regulation, policy, compliance, and ways to proactively work with many of the agencies represented here today. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having us all. I'm Robin Wiseman, Senior Policy Counsel at Coin Center. I'll let Jerry talk a little bit more about what Coin Center does. Um, but for the past year plus at Coin Center and for about a year and a half before that, I've been working with policymakers here in D.C. to help kind of have a dialogue about what digital currency is, what Bitcoin is, what the blockchain is, and help, kind of help try to lessen the divide between the level of knowledge and the technology here to help have productive conversations like this. So thank you. Hello, I'm Jerry Brito. I'm the executive director of Coin Center. Uh, Coin Center is a nonprofit independent think tank based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, that's focused on the public policy issues affecting cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And as Robin said, uh, our mission is to uh, educate um, folks uh, about the technology, so to make sure that they understand the technology that may require regulation. We want to uh, lead in policy thinking there, um, and we advocate for uh, smart regulation that uh, meets regulators' ends while preserving uh, the freedom to innovate. Jerry O'Shea with Fidelity, uh, with our government affairs and public policy team, and mostly here to uh, to, to learn, but we remain very interested in, uh, in Bitcoin and the underlying technologies as well. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm Susan Poole. I'm with the Chamber of Digital Commerce, Director of Development. Uh, it's the Washington, D.C.-based trade association for the digital assets industry. I'm also director of the uh, first annual D.C. Blockchain Summit. That's going to be held here in D.C. on March 3rd, 2016 at Georgetown University. Good morning. My name is Kelvin Chen. I'm the program manager for emerging payments at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. As some of you may be aware, we've got rulemaking authority that could touch on this space as it relates to payments. Uh, we also released a consumer advisory last fall as well as we collect consumer complaints in this space. Good morning. My name is Megan Agruso. I'm with CME Group. We're the world's largest derivatives exchange. I work for our government relations department and I'm here on behalf of Rumi Morales. Good morning, Lael Brainard from uh, the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, we are very interested in how blockchain might impact a whole variety of uh, areas that we uh, have either responsibility for or care about, um, and so mostly uh, interested in learning from you where you think this is going and where you think we need to be uh, more engaged. Thank you. I'm Carrie Granis. I'm part of the Hutchins Center here at Brookings. I'm Jeff Stem. I'm with the Promontory Financial Group, and uh, we have several clients in the space of developing blockchain technology and, and emerging fintech, as, as well as in the more traditional space of uh, financial market infrastructures and payment systems. So we have a, a lot of interest in this space. Uh, Gordon Workema, and I'm Payment Strategy Director for the Federal Reserve System, and our focus is on faster payments and secure payments right now. Sean Rodriguez, also with the Federal Reserve. Uh, my job is this um, thing we're calling faster payments uh, review and, and analysis. I'm uh, David Mills from uh, the Federal Reserve Board in, in Wash here in Washington. Uh, I'm come from the payments division uh, at the board, and I'm generally uh, interested in, in do uh, research and, and work on on this topic in the in the area. 
Hi, I'm Ryan Zagone with Ripple. Uh, we develop real-time uh, payment technology for financial institutions using this technology. Uh, I also sit on the steering committee of the Federal Reserve's Faster Payments Task Force. I'm Vanessa Karjenian. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, interested, I'm on the supervision side and generally interested in fintech and emerging technology trends. I'm Margaret Liu. I'm with the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. We're the Washington Policy and Professional Membership Organization for state banking and financial regulators who oversee a large um, and diverse ecosystem of financial services providers. Apologies. I came from uh, from Wall Street uh, a little over eight years ago, down to Treasury to work for the Paulson team. Uh, and was asked by Geithner to stay on in the sort of the worst of the housing crisis, and had the pleasure of uh, of working closely with Michael Barr on a day to day basis uh, for for uh, about a year and a half. Uh, spent about three years at the Fed, uh, then at the White House, uh, and, and as David Wessel uh, said, I've, I've spent the last uh, six seven months uh, hanging out at Brookings uh, again as a colleague of Michael's and David's. Uh, and, and have enjoyed every moment. So uh, thanks to you all for being here today. Good morning. I'm Dino Falaschetti, Chief Economist at House Financial Services Committee. I've learned a lot about monetary policy from David, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to learn more about blockchain. Hi, I'm Louise Shanner. I'm the Policy Director here at the Hutchins Institute. Uh, thank you all. So um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I've asked Charlie Cooper from R3CEV, which I think was a character in the new Star Wars movie. Um, uh, Brad Peterson. <laughs> Brad Peterson from NASDAQ and Barry Silbert from the Digital Currency Group to start with uh, talking a little bit about how distributed ledger technology might transform financial services, particularly the payment system, over the next decade. What are, what are, what are the hurdles? What are the uncertainties? What are the tensions between incumbents and disruptive startups? <laughs> Is Bitcoin core to this thing or a sideshow? Um, and what what will we should be looking for over the next year or two to tell us signposts where we're going? Um, I've asked Jerry Brito, who uh, you all know now from the from the uh, Coin Center, to take notes and at the end of the, to try and sum up uh, if it's the best he can what what we think we've learned and what questions uh, remain to be answered. Um, so uh, Barry, why don't I start with you? Uh, for, I don't know, three, four, or five minutes, whatever it takes, and then we'll let the other guy speak, and then we'll open it up. Three to five minutes to describe Bitcoin, huh? <laughs> um, so just Bitcoin. That's right. Uh, so, so David assures me that everybody here is, a, is an expert on all things Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, Actually, I want to say, there's going to be one rule, is if someone says something that you generally don't have understand, because it's the name of a company, you don't know what they do, an acronym you don't understand, or a technical term you don't understand, you should say so, because the only way we'll uh, make this at the level that everybody knows what we're talking about is if people feel free to say, like, what the hell is that? Right. So, and I intend to participate in that. Fantastic. Um, so uh, really quickly, Digital Currency Group, uh, it's our mission to accelerate the development of a better financial system. That's what, we, what we've set out to do, and we do that by building and investing in Bitcoin and blockchain companies. As Melta mentioned, we've invested now in 60 companies. Uh, located in 20 countries around the world, which gives us pretty fantastic insight into what's actually happening on the ground. We've started a couple businesses, and as of yesterday, we bought a company called Coindesk, uh, which gives us a platform for media and events to help um, um, support the industry. So um, although everybody is an expert on Bitcoin and blockchain, I'm going to spend just a, a minute on, on the way that I think about it um, and then talk about uh, why we should care, talk about where I think we've been and, and where we are today and where we're going. Uh, and, and so I use the word Bitcoin similar to the way that you would refer to tissues as Kleenex or a copy machine as Xerox. There's lots of different protocols, alternative currencies, but I just use the word Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin, it, I think, could be described as having three primary use cases. You have uh, as a currency or a store of value, number one. You have as a financial rail. And then you have as a ledger on which ownership information can be recorded. OK? 
can do lots of other neat things, but generally speaking, that's how I bucket it. And so I think, um, you know, why we should care um, if you kind of go use case by use case as a digital currency or, or as a store of value um, that's global and, and borderless, it's creating an opportunity in emerging markets in particular in places where currencies um, have been debased or losing value for, um, for, for people in those countries to hold their value in something other than um, devalued currency. There are a lot of similarities between Bitcoin and gold. So I think there's a growing movement um, to position Bitcoin as a, um, as, a, as a way for people to store wealth. Uh, it, it is finite, it's scarce, uh, it's highly divisible, can't be counterfeit, it's fungible, um, which is why people seem to love gold. But the big difference between Bitcoin and gold is, at least in my opinion, Bitcoin actually has um, uh, usefulness. Um, you can buy a car, you can buy a house, you can buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin, hard to do with gold. So that's use case number one. Use case number two as a financial rail, uh, Bitcoin has the potential uh, to remove most, um, if not all, friction in the movements of money around the world. Uh, it has the potential um, to create opportunities and risks around um, um, companies that are putting in place capital controls. Uh, it certainly has the potential to impact monetary policy if, if money does move into Bitcoin in a, in a meaningful way. So we should care about it from that perspective. And then third, as a ledger, um, the ability to create uh, new plumbing for our financial system, starting from scratch using this technology, I think is important. Uh, and I think, by and large, people view it as a fantastic opportunity and little risk given how our financial system works from a financial asset ownership rec recording, clearing, and settlement perspective. So where are we in the whole evolution of, of Bitcoin? So uh, 2008, a white paper was written by a person or a group named Satoshi Nakamoto. 2009, the first version of this um, code was released to the wild. No one, almost no one cared about it. In 2009, 2010, I think in those early years, uh, maybe Stephen was the only one here who hadn't even heard of it and was doing anything, you had um, a bunch of technologists that were experimenting with it. Uh, in 2011, um, there was some press around a website called Silk Road, which is a place where you could go buy drugs and do bad things. The price of Bitcoin started getting established as having value beyond um, negligible. I think that was uh, the, uh, the siren, the, 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 the call for action. And so you started seeing a whole wave of early adopters emerge in 2011, companies starting to build companies um, to focus on this technology. And as Stephen mentioned, BitPay was really one of the first ones. Um, so 2011, early adopter phase starts. Uh, if you fast forward then to 2013, it started getting the interest of venture capital industry. So at that point, you started seeing Folks like Andreessen and Horowitz and Unisquare Ventures and Excel um, investing in the companies that were building the infrastructure uh, for this industry. Uh, to date now, a billion dollars has been invested by really all of the name brand venture firms uh, into the space. Starting in 2015, I kind of consider the next phase, phase four, which is the Wall Street phase. Uh, to my surprise, Wall Street um, embraced the technology and blockchain um, first before the currency element, um, which I do think is going to evolve this year, but, but in 2015 that did start. And kind of where we are right now uh, is we have use cases being identified, we have partnerships being created, we have products being developed, we have proof of concepts being deployed, but it is very early, very early. Um, and I do see around the world today some very meaningful increase and awareness, adoption, and usage of Bitcoin as a currency. We have investments in India, in Kenya, in Mexico, in the Philippines. Uh, it's, it's growing very fast in those markets right now. And again, that's the currency or store of value. Um, and I do believe we are in 2016 going to see the narrative shift back to Bitcoin maybe isn't this terrible Ponzi scheme bubble, maybe it actually can deliver some meaningful value to society. Thank you. Um, Charlie, could you talk a little bit about what, what, whatever you want to talk about, but explain what your company is, and also if you could respond to 
do I need to buy this as digital gold in order to get the um, uh, financial rail and ledger benefits? No. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a right. little bit. Um, let me make a couple comments. First of all, thanks again for, for having us. Uh, there's a beautiful irony here that um, when Bitcoin started, it was founded by a group of people who had strongly anti-Washington views, strongly anti-Wall Street views, et cetera. And here we are, one of the most hallowed think tanks in Washington, um, surrounded by people who are members of the establishment and financial services firms trying to figure out how to make, make a go of it. So um, times have changed, I think, since 2008. Um, R3CEV um, is a, started as a financial innovation firm out of New York, um, not specifically dedicated to blockchain or distributed ledger technology, but looking more broadly. I mean, we have ventures in fixed income uh, trading platforms and FX uh, trading platforms, et cetera. Um, we actually run a, a, a government trading platform, a government trading platform called Liquidity Edge. Um, but it was over the last couple of years that the focus really began to shift onto this blockchain technology. Um, and it evolved over, over a long set of discussions with both Wall Street types who were aware of this and curious about it, as well as technology types who knew a lot more than the Wall Street types, but, but really didn't understand Wall Street. So we had this interesting confluence of events where Wall Street wanted to understand technology they didn't understand, and technologists wanted to understand markets they didn't understand. Um, and it was particularly compelling from the technology side because we operate, Wall Street operates in one of the most highly regulated inter industries in the world. And there are amazing technology companies that are building really cool stuff that is totally irrelevant to what the financial services markets are doing. And if you don't understand Wall Street and you don't understand the regulated nature of it, your technology is useless. It's become an academic exercise. And what R3 did was it came together and it pulled together. It, it started as nine banks. We're now up to 42 banks. And we're, we're broadening out to the buy side and, and the broader exchange, et cetera, community over the next couple of months, where we effectively went to them and said, we can do this one of two ways. The first way, which is the traditional venture capital way, we'll go out to Silicon Valley, we'll raise some money, we'll go build a bunch of stuff, come back to you and hope you like it. Good luck. Or we bring you in first and we figure out what it is that you need, what it is is fit for purpose for the financial services banking industry, and we'll build it with you. And you will sit with us on our architectural working groups and our use case working groups and our legal and regulatory working groups, and you'll supply not just funds to us, but actual people and subject matter experts to help us define what this future state could look like. And that goes to building a base layer as well as potential commercial applications up the stack. Um, and I'm not saying managing a consortium is easy. Um, for every 42 banks in a room, there are 43 opinions at least. Um, but there's a recognition with this technology that the power of, of the technology comes from the networking effect, right? The more people on it, the more useful it is. It's great if you give me a telephone, but if I have nobody to call, it's useless. And the, and, and the more and more people that get on that, on that same network of being able to, and I'm not equating blockchains to telephones, but my point being, in terms of the network itself, uh, th this technology, and I think the reason this consortium came together was a recognition that the power of it is in is in um, collaborative action and a unified approach. Because if everyone goes off and does things in a fractured way, they might solve discrete problems within their individual firms, but the overall power of the technology has been lost. Um, so let me, um, uh, a couple of comments uh, related to whether or not the, the Bitcoin, small b, as the currency versus the blockchain solution are necessarily the same things. Uh, not, you didn't ask me if they're the same things, but do you need to, need to buy the currency idea to, to leverage the technology? Um, I, I guess the jury's still out. We don't believe so. Um, in fact, we strongly don't believe so. Um, I don't know what time it is. I don't know how on the record we are, but um, Mike Hearn – oh, wait, just fine. Um, Mike Hearn, who is uh, one of the, the preeminent core developers in the Bitcoin community who works for R3, um, it'll be in the New York Times any minute, has broken up with Bitcoin today. Um, he has said it's a failed experiment. Um, and, and he believes that the future state for this technology, the distributed ledger and blockchain state, it can be divorced from the technology and, in fact, needs to be to be successful. Um, so um, let me make two other, a couple of framing comments, and then I, I know we've got we to gotta get, get rolling. Um, three things to think about when we talk today. The first one is that if you look at all the Bitcoin-related blockchain distributed ledger startups that exist today, I'd say three years from now, 80% of them are gone. 
that doesn't mean they don't matter. Netscape lasted five years, six years before it was bought and then eventually put out of business by Microsoft. And I would say that Netscape had a more profound impact on the development of the internet than potentially any other company out there. So the fact that there are a lot of these startups looking for attention um, and the fact that some of them may not exist in the same form as they do today does not mean they do not matter. It does not mean the technology that they're trying to build is not important. And I, I think it's worth all of us keeping an eye on all the potential developments here because if we take our eye off one ball, that ball could be the big one. And I know that's a big remit. We can't look at everything. The second thing, um, and I think it's a testament to the fact that we're here, is this technology is real. Um, this isn't, this is, I mean, there may be bubbles in terms of investor funds and those are going to come and go, et cetera, but I think the fact that we're now at this point and having these discussions is evidence of the fact that this technology really does have potentially profound implications, not just in payments, but, but far more broadly. And the third thing, and I, I don't want to get off on a regulatory tangent because I know that's the second half of the day, but this is, this is I think, really interesting and important. Just around this table, we have, I don't know how many regulators that could potentially have some footprint or say over how this technology develops. And that's just on a federal level, not to mention the state level that you're talking about. Um, and in the US, it's, it's incredibly difficult because um, unlike many other countries where the, the regulators fall under a, a, a single umbrella. So if you want to go see the FCA in Europe, for instance, in, in England, for instance, the Bank of England can, they can both be at the meeting. I worked at the CFTC um, in 2005, 6, and 7, and we were supposed to uh, work with the SEC to come up with a regulatory plan for single stock futures. That didn't happen, and it took us two months, no shit, uh, sorry, it took us two months to agree whether to have the first meeting on single stock futures at SEC headquarters or CFTC headquarters. If if the regulatory community, and, and, and so, so A, there's a huge regulatory potential problem here, but I don't think it's insurmountable, but, but it's gonna require a level of coordination, I think that, that's incredibly important. And the one thing I would say to regulators here, um, the headlines, and this, these are sort of past headlines, but the Silk Roads and, and the Mount Jackson, you, 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 you go through the, the list of them, they're scary, and they have regulators nervous, and regulators are asking a lot of very smart, important questions because they're entrusted to make sure that these systems work in a way that benefits the public. Don't be scared of this. We can help you get there. We're happy to help you get there, and we want to help you get there. We recognize that's going to take time. But, but this education process and this type of form is so important to doing it. I think is a key piece in helping us break through some of these regulatory uh, potential barriers and fracturing that we see. And this could be very meaningful and it could benefit in the long run, even regulators themselves, you know, depending on how you want to want to construct a particular ledger or, or blockchain system. So again, thanks for having me and happy to chat more later. Brad. So what's left? What's left? That was, that was a great, that was a no, great no. So uh, start. So. You, you were involved in a stock exchange, right? Yes, I am. A what? technology company. What? Oh, I forgot. Right. So, yes, I know. And I've learned auto companies are now software companies. Exactly. And I'm trying to figure out how to reinvent Brookings. Um, uh, You're a technology knowledge company. I, uh, I, I, okay. <laughs> I was thinking more like uh, the Vatican or something okay. like that. <laughs> I don't know if um, I'd go there. Can you... Can you explain yes. what is it that this technology, distributed in ledger and blockchain, allow you to do that I couldn't do on the NASDAQ, which is a very electronic trading system that doesn't seem to have a lot of obvious frictions and seems to be very decentralized and doesn't have New York Stock Exchange kind of market makers? What is the difference between using this stuff and, and what you did 25 years ago? Okay. Um, so I wasn't there 25 years ago, but I think on the trading side, there's not much. So that, that's kind of the, the obvious difference. And we have the, I like the faster payments project, you know, that is, um, we have, we have a financial system that actually is quite impressive and was built. It was one of the first things to be first industries to really adopt automation. And they adopted on a, a generation of technology that is, uh, predates most of what the, um, the, the technologies that we can talk about later that comprise blockchain. 
and the, and the whole Bitcoin area. So all the technology that that was was first applied to financial services, they were a leader in in automation. Um, they did what they could, you know, and, and you see Apollo, the Apollo, you know, movie of what we sent. Uh, very impressive. We went to the moon with technology in the late 60s. And that's the technology that was um, used at the time to solve the paper crisis that um, that we're currently have, have only incrementally um, innovated on or incrementally improved at the DTCC. So, you know, we have all these institutions that have um, uh, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, they have, they have impressive systems that were built on mainframe technology. Um, at NASDAQ, we, we were the same. We were, we were a group of um, people that came together in 1971, happens to be the same time that my prior firm, Schwab, was formed um, in 1971. And, uh, and, and they you know, did some incredible things back then, but NASDAQ has no mainframe technology anymore, so we are all Linux-based, um, the trading systems, um, we use a fair amount of, of open source. We build a lot of technology ourselves, so we are, we are in fact a technology company and we sell to other exchanges. So we have modernized through crisis. We almost went out of business. We were a pseudo-government agency. We went into a competitive market and the INET platform that we ended up acquiring almost just um, put us out of business. So we had a near-death experience because we were on legacy technology and had no way out. Our current team couldn't get our way out, and a lot of the banks are coming up on that type of modernization. And I don't think they're at near-death experiences, but it's very old technology that is at the basis of our financial system. So um, <clears throat> what, we, what we see is trading is, is microseconds. So we can match the buyer and the seller and then the wait begins, and it's three days, and you, it's three days because that was fast in the paper world. I mean, to settle the trade, three yeah, days to finish the whole thing and move the money and get it all done, and it's not even done at the um, the atomic level of the transaction. So when you build a system today, anybody that builds a payment system, anybody that conceives one, it's at an atomic transaction level. You keep track of everything because it doesn't cost you that much. So we have this netting, this, this kind of very creative netting um, arrangement that we, that we put in place as a compromise back in the 70s for you don't want to keep track of everything because it costs too much and you don't have the technology. So there was no relational database. So the DTCC and the whole design, if you look at it, the original design was for distributed um, record keeping. So transfer of ownership, all of it was... And it was distributed at the time. Paper is the ultimate distributed mechanism. So it was centralized, and there were centralized mainframe databases pre-relational. There was no Oracle. <laughs> there was no Oracle relational database at the time. And there was no distributed. There was no peer-to-peer. -peer, there were no fast networks, um, data networks, that could um, actually distribute this. So all that has come into play to be... Um, it's very obvious to us, but at the time, it, it was a wonderful solution. So I would say at the back end, after the trade, is where, is where we're applying it. So clearing and settlement, um, and then I think ultimately, um, you know, what the Fed is doing, what the Bank of England can do, what we're going to do with, uh, you know, our, our properties in Stockholm around the Swedish kroner. Um, you, you can just move the money. You can keep track of the beneficial owner. Um, you don't have to lose that. Um, now, whether you, whether you expose it, like people may want anonymity, but that's the beauty of security and cryptography. You can decide to show the, the, the IRS that you bought and sold something. The issuer of the company whose stock it is should be able to see every transaction. So it's silly that, that there's the person whose stock it is can't see it till 90 days from now. I can't see who's coming at me. So I think activism is going to really be the catalyst for, if I'm a company, I'm going to be on a stock exchange that gives me absolute transparency into buying and selling of my stock. Okay. So let, me, let me just let me make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying that NASDAQ was already, to the extent that the technology allowed, decentralizing. Yeah. yeah right? we, yes. And the difference between this technology and what 
you have used in the past that allows you to do it better and faster? It, it's the same thing, it's just a, this, or is it fundamentally different? So, so what I would say is this brings together the best of a distributed database, a secure database, and a way to actually create a, um, a version of that that you can, that has been notarized or has been validated, and that's kind of the proof of work piece. So a combination of proof of work and coupled with a role. So it may be that there is a role that someone said, a validator. So a validator role that says. So what role does Bitcoin itself play in that scenario you just said? Well, I would use Barry's Bitcoin, that everything is Bitcoin. But I would, if I were to technically describe it, Bitcoin um, doesn't necessarily play any role, the Bitcoin itself. But the blockchain technology, um, and if we need to define that for folks here, um, I can parse that out. But that would be... Why don't you do that? The people who don't know what it is are going to be afraid to say it, so... Uh, okay. So, so I, li I like to... I really think this is a new way of innovation. I call it innovation by combination. And we talked about... And the reason, I, the, the reason I'm using the late 70s, you know, late 60s, early 70s, that's when a lot of the, the financial services automation really start took hold and that predates all the technology that's in the paper. So, um, but the paper is comprised of innovations that were conceived over 25 plus years. So starting about the mid 70s, um, Ralph Merkel with his PhD paper out in Stanford really came up with um, this, and you see it right in there, the Merkel root. So if you look up, that's who it is. So a lot of the cryptography, so there's the ability to um, secure information so a secure hash um, that's, that's in, included in that. I mentioned Skype, so the peer-to-peer -peer networking, you know, we know Napster, we know Kazaa, we know Skype. Those are all built on peer-to-peer -peer compute, and peer-to-peer -peer compute was developed by those companies and um, predominantly out of, you know, Scandinavia. Um, and those were the founders of Kazaa, were the founders of Skype, um, so the same ones. And then we have um, Hashcash, which is a proof of work. So you, you have some, those are discrete technologies that the folks who conceived and wrote the paper put those together. They combined those, those into a system and it created unique benefits. Themselves, individually, they were, um, they're not, they're not um, powerful, but put together, it's incredibly powerful. They also, though, put in economic, um, they combined economic concepts. So you have a monetary policy that is 140 years, right? It conceives how money is, um, is released in the system. So that's pretty innovative. And there's this competitiveness, economic competition that's in there as well, and some economic risk reward with a backing off of resource contention. So supply and demand is in there. You know, if, if it gets too hard, back off the algorithm if it gets too easy, you know, make it harder. So that's innovation by combination. And I would say um, I'm surprised that Oracle, Microsoft, that anyone who understands databases, that they aren't in this, um, this is right at their core. So they have to secure their databases. They build distributed databases, and um, this is a great market for them. So I expect this year, so my, my prediction is this is going to be the year of the um, Microsoft, Oracle, Google, um, you know, maybe, maybe some other ones, maybe Apple, that, uh, that really say, hey, we got this. We'll, we'll build you a platform, and it's, it's going to work, and it's going to be global, and it's going to be distributed. So I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to attract um, quite a few. So that's what I think is the... The underlying technology, and let's call it blockchain, is a distributed database. It's a secure security, um, uh, the security algorithms that are there, and and it gives you the ability to tune proof of work. By the way, Bitcoin's proof of work is quite, um, it's it's quite heavy, as we've all read about. And um, to get scale, you can back that off, and and we've already done that so that we could capture um, our full day's trading, which is quite active, um, on a on a blockchain that has a lighter proof of work. So we're not worried about the volume um, that that exists today. We think a lot of companies are are really going to solve that 
quite well. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, let me open it up. I'm interested in what people here think, either on the business or the government side, about what will determine over the next 20, 12, what is the technology going to, what should we look for in technology over the next 12 to 24 months, and what are the applications of this to the payment system? How will we know which way this is going? David, can I make one, one yeah, quick please. point? Um, I just wanted to, to quickly respond to, uh, to um, you know, what Charlie and Brad said. So uh, the conversation is mainly focused on the ledger. And I just want everybody to appreciate, you know, the two use cases I mentioned other than the ledger as a global currency store of value and as a rail can be successful or not separate and apart from the ledger and the use cases and the opportunities that those create. Again, it's, it's Bitcoin could be all three, could be none of the three, it could be one of the three. So I, I just want to kind of make that point because I think it does impact our financial system as, as meaningfully as the opportunities around this distributed database concept. Can I just um, maybe uh, ask uh, or poke and prod a little bit on the Barry Charlie conversation a little bit more because I think um, um, I think there may be some tension between the different use cases and it'd be useful to explore for example um, can the technology be a really good a store of value or a good asset class and also be useful for the other two use cases it's not obvious to me that that's that that's plausible so I'd, I'd love to see the Tension explored a little bit. Um, so I think um, the reason why I'm I'm um, I do agree that it kind of the the jury's still out as to whether or not Bitcoin, the currency, is necessary for the blockchain use case as a ledger. Um, my skepticism, though, is really all around. In the history of innovation, in the history of, of advancements from a financial technology perspective, it tends to come from outside the industry. And the industry tends to embrace kind of the winner after the market has decided who the winner is. And um, the idea of having um, as much as I think the R3 team is fantastic and I wish them total success, <laughs> the I idea of putting together 42 banks, even three banks, to agree on standards and solutions, in the recent history of Wall Street and technology innovation, it just it doesn't typically happen that way. I'm not saying it won't. And what is unique, and I think beautiful, uh, uh, about Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain is that it is, it allows for permissionless innovation. It'll, it's an open platform on which anybody with a great idea can try to build on top of it. And so again, my, I'm not suggesting that it can't be that, that, that you need Bitcoin for the ledger. I'm just saying, um, I think from an innovation perspective, we should keep an open mind as to where the innovation may come from. Um. So a couple things. Um, first of all, I, I definitely agree with Barry. The, the jury is still out. I mean, we've obviously picked our what we perceive as the answer, um, and we wouldn't have done that had we not felt that that was the right way to go. But I, I don't I don't want to imply that that it's so blatantly obvious. In fact, my guess is we're going to walk out of here tomorrow at the end of today with more questions than we have answers. Um, and I'm per, you know I think I think we're perfectly fine with that. Um, the, the the question about getting wh whether or not there's a th this sort of I would almost call it a Bitcoin as being sort of an organic effort that that it that it grew together um, with a group of people people collaborating to create something something quite new that could go cross market and whether or not that is some you know a, a better approach than a banking consortium approach um, I'd say two things first of all. Um, <clears throat> Banking, cons yeah, work getting a consortium to work together is difficult, but when there's a problem that needs to get solved, it's amazing how clarifying that can be for thinking. Market, trade web, FX all, eSpeed, broker tech are all market consortiums where the banks came together, realized they needed to do something better, and they built a way to do it. Now, is that the rule or the exception? 
it, it's not everything. I mean, there have been a lot of consortiums that have failed. But again, when you're dealing with a technology like this, the success of which is dependent upon um, collaboration and, and working together in the networking effect, it's, it's, a, it's, a, real, it's a real incentivizer. Um, so I don't know, um, again, I, 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 I'm certainly not enough of a, a, a technology specialist and I'm not a, a Bitcoin, um, the term we use at the office is maximalist, but, but the people who really believe in that underlying technology. What I can tell you is that in, in, the, in, in our consortium itself, the, the question about Bitcoin itself as a currency is, is not even related to our work. It's, it's not something that, that comes up. These are member, our, our, our various different groups are made up of technologists and lawyers and engineers, et cetera, who are seeking to solve a problem that a distributed ledger technology could potentially solve wholly apart from, from Bitcoin. It, with as a currency, and if it turns out that that currency itself, um, if 2016 is the year of the currency, um, and it and it it surges, okay. I mean that's great. That doesn't that doesn't uh, you know affect the ability for these technologies to be deployed far more broadly across asset class. Um, the concern I have with the focus on the tech on the currency itself, and again this is for I'm speaking for our members right, and in the financial services community is that the way in which the underlying technology, the, the blockchain, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, as opposed to blockchains or distributed ledger technologies outside of that, um, our membership and our technology team have pretty unifiedly agreed is not fit for purpose for the financial services community. It's not robust enough. It can't handle the volume. It can't handle the complexity of transactions. And if indeed that hypothesis is right, um, then the debate over the, the currency itself becomes really secondary to trying to figure out a solution that would solve for the complexity of Wall Street as well as work within the regulatory confines with some of the people in this room have, have jurisdiction over. I don't know if that answers your question. Clay, Michael, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, extremely helpful. So I just wanted to focus on the kind of permissioned ledger piece of this for just a moment and uh, ask you as you think about the parts of exchanges that this might impact, payment and settlement in particular, diminishing risk there, how, how should we think about how collateral practices might change over time? What are the implications of this to thinking about those pieces? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it, it, it has great promise for, number one, the collateral you need and how you, how you really can, can assign it more nimbly. If you, if you absolutely have it assigned to something, you're using collateral, um, you can maybe think about it in terms of burst capacity like Amazon. So today someone has to... Um, uh, you know, you have to have enough capacity and liquidity when you're when you're um, lubricating the f various markets around the world, and they're kind of static, right? They open up, they close um, around the world, and you have to put in your kind of maximum amount for the day. And that's, I would call it analogous to the way we used to build our capacity in data centers, our, our proprietary data centers before Amazon. You had to have all the capacity for the you know the worst case scenario and and it costs you money so i think i think the way we manage collateral the way we manage um you know just the funds required to lubricate the financial markets every day is is far too static so you have you have you have a the ability to get that to be more um more dynamic without it being double used and that's that's, I think, where we get into a lot of trouble. You know, the naked short selling, the security lending, that really doesn't go back to the, because you couldn't before, you really didn't have the ability to handle the transaction volumes and get back to the, the original source of the asset and what is it used for at that moment. And it, and it then had to be maybe um, committed for a, a longer period of time just because the commit process was inefficient. So I think all of this is just, you think around things that happen today in a more dynamic fashion, but I, I go to Amazon as the great one that, um, that we, we in technology can, can add capacity um, very quickly, you know, within minutes. So that has profound implications for how much um, compute is tied up that is doing nothing for us, that's burning electricity. 
So I look at it as a great sustainability play. Um, I look at it as a great, great efficiency play for, for our economies. And then when you speed things up in time, so when you can do something, you just don't have things tied up for as, as long a period. So I, I, I think there is a, it's not very exciting, you know, there's, a, there's an efficiency and productivity play here that is, that is profound. Um, and now that as I was listening Don't to oversell it now. But no, no, it, it is, no, it's, it's, it's actually not hard. It's the technology and the, and the transaction. I, I realize, though, that what I'm working on is not as exciting as what Barry's vision is. And I think Barry has the, um, you know, I'm working very practically in, you know, here's a problem that I think um, technology has matured so we can solve it. And people are going to, at the right moment, want to tackle it and do this. But I think what, what Barry's pointing to is the innovation comes from oftentimes outside the industry that is really um, earth shattering. And that's what Google did to advertising. So Google was sitting there out in the West Coast. Everyone knew in New York City um, the attribution of, of advertisement. Did I move the consumer? Did I make a difference? Um, was the holy grail. But no one in New York knew the technology, underlying technology, and understood the impact of the web. And Google enabled that. You have greater you're closer to attribution when you have an ad that you get in action. And that's really what advertising is about. So they're, they simply are kind of fulfilling what, what advertisers have been trying to do but haven't been able to measure it. So in financial services, I agree with Barry, I think there is something coming from outside the industry that is going to make a great improvement, a tremendous improvement, and, and it's, it's worth um, – I mean, it's worth maybe asking Barry to talk more about where he thinks it's coming from. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that we, we can talk about this later. I think there are two things that make the Google – a lot of this stuff is always what's the right analogy, what's the right historical metaphor, what's right. the right – so uh, two things we know. One is this is a highly regulated industry. Google did not have to ask the New York Times that permission. Is a, that is a good point. Permission to steal its advertising. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and secondly, uh, we did just learn – that the stability of the financial system is an enormous public good that we took for granted in 2006, and by 2008 we realized we shouldn't have taken it for granted. So there's going to be, in, uh, I don't want to be in the Paul Volcker camp, you know, Paul Volcker's famous line, the only useful financial innovation is the ATM. Uh, but I think there is more suspicion about the downsides of financial innovation in 2016 than there was a decade ago, and that will have an impact. Matt, I wonder if I could ask you to weigh in here on, you have to decide where to put your money. So the argument here basically is about, A, is Bitcoin the currency as a store of value essential? And B, is it going to be the startups, like the ones that Barry's investing in, or the existing financial institutions, like the ones who are working with Charlie, who are most likely to be the uh, people who change the world for the better? Yes or no answers will suffice. <laughs> uh, no, you gave me a juicy one there. So um, I, I would hold the mic a little bit closer. It's not. Uh, yeah. uh, we're not yet in 21st century technology here. <laughs> you, you gave me a juicy one there. So I would uh, definitely agree with Barry. If you look at uh, history of technology, whether it's a corporate VC group or labs in uh, Fortune 1000 companies, a lot of the innovation does not come from there. It comes from the outside. Comes from people that are. Uh, underfunded, have big visions, don't see the brick walls that uh, typically are seen within companies, and these entrepreneurs punch through those brick walls. So from a uh, energy uh, and innovation standpoint, that historically, if history is any indicator, is going to come from outside those walls. Uh, what I see happening in, um, with all these private blockchains, so you, you hear this uh, private blockchain phenomenon, these, this public blockchain phenomenon, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, someone mentioned uh, the network effect. I think it was Charlie. That's a very important dynamic here because you have, uh, you know, we, we could build a better Facebook today, right? And we could launch it. Nobody's going to go on it because everybody's on Facebook. That, that network effect is taking place on social. It's taking place on Alibaba. It's taking place on uh, Airbnb and Uber and everything else. These networks are very, very important. And it's a, it's a combination of capital, people, energy, and this fabric starts to build upon itself o over time. Uh, we're seeing that with the Bitcoin blockchain, this public blockchain that has all this capital, innovation, um, 
and, and time and energy being uh, put towards it. But it's a scary phenomenon for uh, regulated Fortune 1000 companies to say, uh, I'm going to build and innovate on this um, public blockchain. And uh, there's these Bitcoins that are, that are mined, that could be <laughs> mined in North Korea or in Cuba or, you know, in, in uh, countries that are maybe off-putting to, to, uh, to some of these uh, companies. So they, they focus on the technology, underlying technology, the, the, the blockchain technology. And I, I, I use the analogy of, uh, you know, it's like asking uh, Citibank to jump into the ocean. And they're like, well, I, I can't really do that. But what, what, what I will do is build a, a private pool. It'll probably be a heated pool. It'll be an invite-only party. We'll jump in. We'll get wet. We'll understand how to swim. Uh, and we'll really uh, build off the utility of this uh, blockchain technology in our own way. And we'll trade you know, pork bellies or, or gold or euro dollars or whatever. And we'll start getting comfortable in this new con construct of a, of a blockchain. Uh, over time, th th they'll work like intranets or extranets. And those chains will wind up uh, connecting with other chains. So we'll trade pork bellies with uh, uh, folks from Asia or Europe, and then we'll get other products. And pretty soon, uh, my sense is you'll see a constellation of chains, and interoperability will be very, very important. And then ultimately, people within those chains are going to say, do we trust each other? Um, doesn't matter because our auditor or some third party is going to say, we need to put some data outside of our existing chain to a third party a public blockchain would be a great place to do that. And so that data security model that a public blockchain, like the Bitcoin blockchain, that has the network effect today, uh, is going to be a very uh, high consequence to this ecosystem. So that's kind of my perspective on, on how I see the evolution of what's happening now. And, and the use cases that are happening within uh, banks and financial services are very appropriate. They're, they're in the, uh, an industry that's the that's, uh, uh, industry of money. It's one of the most highly regulated industries on the planet. So. They have to do that because they don't see the lines uh, that are drawn for them right now, and they can't afford to, to cross that line. When I go, I'm, I'm still, I love your metaphor, although I, I'm not sure that very many bankers think about going underwater is the metaphor that they, uh, that they use to describe their business strategies, although it may have been the strategy at City, as if what we've seen. <laughs> um, if I go from the intranet thing, the private network where it's 40 banks or 100 banks, and then I want to go to integrate that 100 bank network with another 100 institution network, and I go, as you say, to the public blockchain. At that point, do I have to have what Barry has? I have to have like a Bitcoin at the, at the root of it? Bitcoin, for, for me, is a, it, it's, uh, the way I look at it, is a, it's an incentive mechanism to secure the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. And it's, it's like the kindling that gets the, uh, the party started for the public blockchain. So you, you need that incentive mechanism for miners to mine. And to, why do they mine? They want, they want this, this bounty of Bitcoin. So that winds up creating a very secure network. And over time, obviously, the, the Bitcoins dissipate, right? Uh, and then the transaction fees start kicking in because when I want to hash some data in the, into the blockchain, I pay a transaction fee for that. How do I pay that transaction fee to these miners? I have to do it in the native currency of the blockchain. It's called Bitcoin. So it, it kind of comes back on itself uh, in terms of the utility of Bitcoin today is a bounty. It's a, it certainly is, is driving itself as a uh, store of value currency. But over time, it doesn't go away. It's still na the native currency on that private, or I'm sorry, on that public blockchain, on that networked uh, blockchain. So it's very important today and over time. And and I, I make a, uh, a similar investment thesis that that Barry does, where you know some people just say, hey, let's invest in uh, uh, Bitcoin companies, blockchain companies, and avoid the currency. Let's, let's just put that aside and, you know, um, I think it's the, the um, uh, opposite uh, uh, equation where about two-thirds of my dollar actually goes into Bitcoin, a third goes into the ecosystem companies because you have, you have uh, two flywheels going on here. One is um, the, the speculative flywheel of, of Bitcoin where you have miners mine, speculators buy and hold, and then you have the blockchain flywheel, and this one has kind of been ho-hum for last year. Uh, the, 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 utility of the blockchain. So this is the throughput applications, uh, transactions, all the uh, dynamics of, of blockchain are just starting to, we're just starting to see that happen now. And once that flywheel starts turning, uh, the price of Bitcoin will react. Um, so so I, I view Bitcoin as a, um, for all the positive attributes, uh, Barry mentioned, uh, great store of value. Uh, uh, it's like a digital gold, but it's very much unlike digital gold because you could, uh, 
uh, break it up. You could put on your, uh, you know, your cell phone. Uh, you can make it programmable. So it's got all these ultra benefits of gold. Um, but over time, it looks like a tracking stock over the ecosystem. So people say, hey, how do I invest in which company should I invest in or who's the best entrepreneur or whatever? Uh, and I just say buy Bitcoin. Because if all the stuff that happens in this ecosystem, again, my perspective, um, and that flywheel starts turning, the price of Bitcoin will react. Okay. Uh, Charlie, just yeah. two, two quick points on the permission versus the public um, piece. In the long term, it's entirely possible that a public blockchain solution might work for financial services. The, the, the difficulty for the financial services community is that a public blockchain relies upon a proof of work concept <clears throat> with anonymous nodes sitting out there validating transactions and coming to consensus. I at least don't yet know of one regulator that is going to be comfortable with anonymous nodes sitting out there determining what financial tra transactions are valid or not. We may get there. Um, it certainly, I don't think, is happening anytime soon. And, and you know, based on traditional um, amount of time it takes in, in, in the regulatory community to get up to speed and to begin to adopt certain technologies, and certainly in this one, which is very new um, and somewhat controversial, or, or at least began that way. Um, I think we're, we're a long way off from, from getting to that point. The second thing, and I don't, I don't want to get us off on a total tangent, so I'm, I'm somewhat reticent to bring it up, the incentive piece about Bitcoin is actually, is actually quite important. Um, the key to the system, the public blockchain and Bitcoin, is making the financial incentive for mining more attractive than the financial assist, uh, uh, incentive for attacking or hacking the network. As soon as that balance tips, the entire protocol, the entire consensus mechanism begins to break down. And when you're dealing with financial transactions, if you're looking at something like a watermark token or a colored coin, where you're piggybacking on a token. Okay, that, can you describe Sorry. That? Sorry. Um, so the idea is, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a watermark token, the idea is you take what would be considered um, um, a – how do I do this in a – so imagine, imagine Bitcoin is a, is a bit of currency. Imagine it that as a store of value. What you effectively do is you strip away that value, you maintain that, that coin, and you attach other things to it. That you, can, that you can use the distributed ledger and blockchain technology work. So, for instance, if you were working in smart contracts, interest rate swaps is an example, um, you would use a watermark token that doesn't have any value in Bitcoin. Its value is that, is that interest rate swap, that it is piggybacking on that coin to move around the system. As these, as these transactions that are being onloaded onto the system and they're, being, and, and they're more and more valuable and more and more complex, it's very hard to keep up with the increasing price, I guess, or the value of the Bitcoin that would need to incentivize them to not try to ha hack off and take that asset from, from the network itself. Now, does that not mean it could evolve? It, it absolutely could evolve. But right now, the complexity and the amount of value in the financial services system compared to the amount of value in Bitcoin itself is so tilting in the, in the, in the way of financial services that I think that mechanism for now breaks down. And until you get to a point where you can incentivize miners to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing, if you try to onload significant asset classes onto a blockchain-like mechanism, the incentive flips the other way to try to cause harm rather than good. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry, oh, please. Why don't you say who you are because some people have come in late. Hi, my name's Ryan Zagone, I'm with Ripple. Uh, I want to follow up with a couple comments on uh, particularly the, the conversation about what we'll see going forward mm -hmm. and uh, the ecosystem we see developing. Uh, so right now, the, I think blockchain and Bitcoin has been described as a panacea for everything in financial services. We spent two years working with, with banks for proof of concepts, pilots, and live products that they're working over our network now to learn that that is not the case, that Bitcoin or blockchain is not needed to solve all of our issues. As was said earlier, DTCC can go real time today with the technology they have today. It's not a technology problem. What we're focused on and where blockchain comes in is on use case specific issues. So in finding a use case where there's friction that could benefit from blockchain. So in our vision of the future is that you have some blockchain or, or Bitcoin uh, networks developed, both private and public, and you also have centralized systems like DTCC running today. 
The, and the value we see going forward is not in building a network that everyone uses, but in connecting these different networks. So we see a very uh, a varied ecosystem of both distributed companies or distributed networks along with centralized networks. And the value here is going to be connecting those. There was a comment earlier about do we need blockchain to connect those? And we wholeheartedly think no. We, that is not uh, necessary, and nor do we think uh, we'll likely see that. Uh, likely because of the permissions, the operational resiliency concerns that come up when outsourcing the, the uh, operations of a network to unknown parties. Uh, that's far outside of what we see from in the regulatory construct. Uh, so we likely see uh, an interoperability protocol that gets developed that is not blockchain-based. You mean the individual networks may be blockchain-based, but the network-to-network -network thing is not? Correct. And I would point folks to the W3C, the Web Standards Group for the Internet. They have a, such protocol that they're working on now called Interledger. And it's a non-blockchain protocol that connects centralized systems and distributed, uh, along with distributed to distributed. It creates an internet of value, as we see it, where there's connectivity between all different types of systems, and systems that are designed for use case specific problems, not one architecture that we apply to everything. I don't think that's where we'll see a practical application of, of these tools. Um, Jerry Brito, what questions about the applications of this technology to financial services and payments will we be able to answer two years from today that we can't answer today? So I, th I think it has to do with, so what struck me, obviously, is this sort of tension between a permissioned and open network, or permit permission and closed net networks and the more open ones, and whether we will have the regulatory um, uh, sort of audacity to maybe allow the open networks, which is really where the innovation I think is promising to exist. And, you know, the question so far has been, you know, do you need Bitcoin or not? And to me, we need to ask ourselves well, the question is, why are we asking this? What does Bitcoin give you? You know, why do you want it? And I think, as Charlie said, and Matt sort of pointed out, is that the power from all of these networks really comes from the network effects, which is why, you know, R3 wants to get 40 banks together to build this. Um, and it's not just the network uh, uh, effects, it's also the fact that something can be permissioned or permissionless. If something is permissionless, you're gonna necessarily have greater network effects because anybody can join without asking uh, for permission. And the only way you can have a global permissionless network is with the use of a token that incentivizes uh, security of the network, and that's Bitcoin. So that's why you need uh, this token. So really the innovation of something like Bitcoin and blockchain um, it's not just a more efficient way to settle, maybe a little bit faster. It's really the fact that for the first time, you can have these networks in a way that are permissionless, the way the internet is permissionless. And permissionless just means that anybody can just get a laptop, download some software, and join the network and begin to innovate on it. And we don't know what's going to happen from this. So we've had some talk about um, all the innovation comes from the outside. And I think what the outside means really is bottom up. It's bottom-up innovation versus top-down innovation. And we have some great examples of this. Uh, you know, Charlie was saying that Bitcoin is organic. I think it absolutely is. And then the question that's uh, still, uh, the jury's still out on is, is organic innovation better than top-down? Um, and we have examples. So if you think about the Internet itself, we had competitors to the Internet. The Internet was not predetermined to be the internetworking standard. TCPIP was not you know, preordained to be the, network, the networking standard that we would all use globally. Uh, you had some other uh, competitors, and mind you, TCPIP is a bottom-up, uh, uh, open-source um, uh, effort that was built organically. Um, on the other side, you had, for example, Minitel in France, which was a French national telecom system that was built as from a consortium of telecom companies uh, and, and, and built top-down. The Internet wiped that away. Uh, one of the biggest competitors to the Internet was the X25 standard, which was developed by the International Tele Telecommunications Union, of the UN, and it was a very complex, robust, it was kind of like the Betamax of internet working standards, but the VHS internet blew it away because it was permissionless, right? It was not a consortium of global telecom companies, which is what X25 was. Um, uh, and so while there's absolutely value um, in uh, improving your back office efficiency, um, I think ultimately when you, what, what the value of 
uh, of, of the blockchain is the fact that it's global and it's permissionless, and that's where the emission is going to come. So the question then, as you've pointed out, uh, the New York Times, or Google didn't have to ask the New York Times for permission, right? Uh, the question is, will regulators um, allow uh, this potential innovation to go on impeded, not, you know, completely take their eyes off it and be completely hands off? Of course, there's a, there's a, there's a role there, and it's an important one. Um, but the question is, do we say, no, we're just not going to allow this because we don't know who the miners are? What I see um, is that that's really not an option available to regulators. Um, the network is going to continue. There are going to be miners mining in Russia, whether regulators here allow companies in the U.S. to use it or not. And innovation is going to continue on that network. And so the question is, do regulators want to say to themselves, look, this is going to happen one way or the other. Do we want to figure out a way to really study this and figure out a way that we can uh, uh, steer it the right way, um, have good engagement, or do we just want to say, look, U.S. companies are not going to allow to innovate using the open global blockchain. We're going to focus on these private blockchains and allow the rest of the world to take off with that open global network. Um, perry Ann, maybe I can ask you, it seems to me uh, it's quite a challenge to have a coalition of companies at this stage when no one is completely sure where the, to the technology is going and where there are some strongly held views about which way is more a practical way to success. So talk to me a little bit about how you, how you see this thing evolving and what do you think are the questions about technology, we can get to regulation later, that you hear most often when you get your group together? Yeah, these are good points as well. Uh, anytime you bring multiple opinions to the table, you're going to get a various set of ideas and philosophies of the way the, the technology and the regulation should go. So absolutely, that's challenging. And that's the purpose of the Chamber of Digital Commerce is to allow a forum for those conversations to take place before you necessarily go public uh, with any particular views. Um, as far as a regulatory approach on the technology, we very much see that at this point in the game, we really don't understand exactly what this technology is going uh, to bring us in the long term. Uh, just like the early days of the Internet, uh, the first consumer application of the Internet was email, sending a simple message online instantly for free. One of the first consumer applications of the blockchain has been these currency applications. But now with Internet technology several decades uh, into this um, experiment, we see that the Internet is much bigger than email. It's something that we use for shopping, e-commerce. It touches every area of the markets. Government uses it. A lot of different functions that couldn't have been foreseen in the early 90s uh, have been completely recreated with the Internet. Very similar to the blockchain. We're still in extremely early days, to, re to reiterate uh, comments of uh, several of the speakers here. Um, it's very early days. It's very early to truly tell where this technology is going to go. Uh, I see that blockchain technology can truly touch every facet of the markets. Uh, one industry that I think can have huge potential is in, uh, in medical and in healthcare. Uh, I was in the White House the day the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, which mandated electronic health records. I don't know about you, but I do know uh, when any, anytime you digitize these types of documents, cybersecurity is a huge threat. I think the blockchain and the cryptology and the security behind it could be a great option uh, to securitizing electronic health records. And I know that the healthcare community hasn't spent a lot of time truly learning about the blockchain, but I think over time people will realize uh, this can breach that industry as well. And it'll hit every industry of the markets from entertainment. Think about how you can protect and um, save IP of, of music and other artists. Uh, and as well as, uh, I think it was one of our earlier speakers mentioned, uh, this will be the year of your oracles and your other tech giants that begin to put forward their blockchain strategies. We're seeing that come together as well. So from a regulatory perspective, uh, it's really early to truly put down parameters because we're not even sure exactly which direction this is going to go. And it could go in many different directions all at the same time. 
Uh, so it's important to truly um, spend time educating yourself on the power and the potential of this technology and to have foresight. This is something we did when we went to North Carolina, as you all know. Uh, the states are taking very different um, approaches to regulating virtual currency. Um, what uh, New York has done has been controversial to some other state regulators by creating a bit license, their own licensing regime. Uh, we went to North Carolina and spent some time with the commissioner of banks down there who decided they were going to take a different approach. They wanted to update their existing money transmission statutes. They had no interest in regulating anything outside of money transmission, um, and they had a piece. They have a piece of legislation. Uh, the language is quite broad, so we sat down with their their counsel and the and the uh, commissioner and kind of explain to them some of the applications that we're seeing that will come down the pipeline over the next several years. Um, they had no idea that you could use the blockchain for 2.0 applications, for non-financial applications, like issuing land deeds or a birth certificate. Um, so we were able to get North Carolina to put out very specific guidance that said, we're here to regulate money transmission. We're not here to regulate anything from a 2.0 or a non-financial perspective. And that really was a milestone for this industry, for a state regulator to put in writing uh, specific types of applications they have no interest in regulating. Um, you know, so our motto at the chamber is regulate by function. Uh, look at exactly what the entity is doing and have very narrow parameters um, on how you look at that because over time this technology is going to go in many different directions. We can't totally foresee it today because it is so early. Uh, but for those who have spent time studying the blockchain, it's undeniable the power of this technology can reach many different markets at the same time, similar to how the Internet has transformed every area of commerce. Now, while we are very early in this process, this isn't the first time we've had to ask ourselves this question. How do we regulate a new technology that we don't understand how it's going to evolve? We, we sat around similar tables back in 1997 and asked the same question about the Internet. And while we didn't know how to regulate it then, we did come forth globally with a set of pillars that we use even today on how to regulate e-commerce. And that was that regulation should be simple, clear, consistent, coordinated, has security and consumer protections. And that was proposed by Bill Clinton, at the time president, to the UN. It was adopted there and it was adopted in Europe under the Bond Declaration. And we, we set out a, a framework for thinking about electronic technology in a way that was very clear and consistent globally, happening at the level of the activity. I see this as we're, we're repeating history a little bit. And I, I often go back to, the, to the, uh, Clinton's electronic commerce proposal and quote directly from it when talking with regulators about how we build a regulatory framework today that supports innovation in a way that's safe and allows us to innovate uh, without uh, potentially stopping some of the benefits from taking root. So I think it's important to know, we, this isn't the first time we've asked these right. questions. We've, we've faced this many times. Jerry? Yeah. I, I just want to echo what Ryan is saying. Th this is what I was getting at. Regulators are going to face a choice. Do they want to look at a global open permissionless ledger that requires a Bitcoin and say, this is something that's so scary that, you know, as Charlie was saying, it's useless to us. In Wall Street, it's just useless because it's something that we can't use given the regulations. And therefore, sort of, go to a world where Google does have to ask permission in the New York Times and the regulator puts their thumb in the New York Times and we give up everything that we've gotten from Google and the Internet, all the innovation. Or do we want to do what we did correctly when we faced these same challenges uh, with the early Internet and do what the Clinton administration did? Go read uh, the Clinton administration's uh, e-commerce uh, white paper. That Just take that white paper, remove the word e-commerce, and write blockchain. And that's that's uh, the way to do it. But I mean, it, but that there's an underlying assumption there that all innovation is necessarily good, mm -hmm. and stopping it is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a guy in here from DeepMind, which is the AI unit that Google bought, and one of the reasons he was here is that he's worried that um, China, which is pretty good at this stuff, and the U.S. will get in an arms race to develop uh, autonomous weapons. And without some kind of agreement to, to limit, what, to, to put fail-safe in an autonomous weapon, we could, 
he doesn't want to be responsible for creating the technology that lets the Chinese autonomous weapon misunderstand what the American autonomous weapon is, and we have we destroy the world, and uh, you know, like 2001, the movie only worse. Mm -hmm. And so, it don't, isn't don't you have to pause and say, okay, what are the downsides to what are the risks that this innovation presents, and how do we evaluate them so we don't learn too late that we've made a mistake. Absolutely. And nobody is saying no regulation. What we're saying is um, we can't simply apply unthinkingly I got the existing regulation to this new technology. And by the way, a technology that because it's distributed and decentralized uh, and open and global and permissionless, it's not going to go away. The technology, its development and its use will continue. Um, the question is not whether that will continue or not. I got that. Well, but, but, but think about it. Um, uh, if you if you say simply we're not going to allow our companies to use it, you're not doing anything about the risks that are still there. Okay, Michael. Uh, I was just going to uh, continue uh, maybe a footnote to the theme because I was uh, in the Clinton administration at the time we were debating these sets of issues in the in the 1990s, and I think there was a, a recognition that's important to have is not the only thing. To, to your point, David, but it's important to have, which is we didn't feel like we really understood fundamentally what direction this could take off in. And we thought that basically the risks of locking in the, the dinosaurs was much greater than the risks of uh, waiting to see what would happen. Um, uh, you know, and I'll say some more about this, and excuse me, I'm being attacked by a bug. Um, uh, it could be an AI bug. Uh, <laughs> But um, I, I do think there are significant downside risks in this area that we should worry about. I think the challenge is, can we develop regulations that don't lock in the dinosaurs and block the innovation while not eliminating but reducing the risk that the worst outcomes uh, take place? And so I think that's the, that's the balance people are struggling for or should be struggling for as we think about the broader policy realm. Uh, uh, given that we're starting to drift in the direction of policy, uh, and, and, and clearly that's a large part of the goal of, of the discussion today, but uh, we're going to do a break in, in 15 minutes. And the, uh, but but I, I think we just wanted to make sure it's very clear that we've heard from all of our experts that want to weigh in on as we think about these different use cases, as we think about some of the tension uh, about uh, potential competing technologies or applications. Uh, that, that coming back to this question of uh, uh, as we go into the policy section, uh, what are the clear, the, uh, coming back to what are the clear um, open questions and how will they be decided? So policy will be part of that context, but is it, is it about a race to develop the technology? Is it about uh, how industry adopts it? Is it uh, X, Y, and Z? So uh, maybe just invite uh, those that want to weigh in just back to this question of what do you think the three or four most important questions uh, uh, will we'll drive the outcomes here, and and, and then. Uh, and you mean non policy questions? Do we, or uh, you, you, or situating policy? You, policy could be one of those, but but provide some context. Is regulation the whole ball game here, or is it a function of what industry ultimately chooses to do, or is it a function of whether the innovators can innovate quickly enough uh, to, to to deliver the technology solutions that that get over things like uh, security and the fifty one percent hack and the. Uh, cybersecurity worries and and uh, scalability and things like that. What 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 are the core issues and how do you weight those that will that will really uh, drive sort of solve the question of of uh, or the direction of Barry versus Charlie in terms of where this all goes? Well, I'm I'm going to give you my top three: um, <laughs> banking, banking, banking. Uh, we have investments in 60 companies. These companies have raised an aggregate. 70% of the venture capital money that's been invested into the space, excluding the miners, um, backed by the best investors in the world, run by ethical, well-intentioned entrepreneurs, they can't get bank accounts. And what is the result of that is we're starting to see innovation happening in the UK, in Singapore, in Germany, in places where the governments have taken a much more supportive, accommodative approach to this industry. Sri, you want to? Um, 
I was thinking about uh, a lot of talk about innovation in the context of uh, the regulated environment. We Could are you just living. pull the mic a little bit more Sorry. in your direction. Uh, talking, thinking about uh, innovation in the context of the sort of regulated environment. A uh, couple of uh, sort of examples might be illustrative, and my background is in uh, exchanges, so sort of the examples are from there. Uh, there was a company which was, uh, that was my first job after grad school, which was a $450 million experiment in coming up with a new market structure called Optimark Technologies. And those were the days when there were lots of uh, efforts to come up with new electronic trading systems, and the banks were busy investing in all of them. And so it was $450 million was invested in this venture. Uh, it was implemented for the NASDAQ market also. It didn't succeed. It failed. At the same time, there was another entity called Island, which was taking a path of least resistance. And so what happened with Optimark was it ran against certain rules of the New York Stock Exchange the SEC had and didn't succeed. There were other ventures which took the path of least resistance, and Island is a classic example. Very low-cost investment. They didn't really go to the consortium. It was very sort of self-funded. And took the path of least resistance and, and within the context of a sort of a network effect marketplace, uh, gained some good traction and actually ended up replacing NASDAQ's uh, mainframe-based technology. Right. So now sitting on the other side as a mar inside a, a market regulatory agency, uh, I agree that regulations will take a long time to sort of cope up with these things. Uh, unfortunately, while as a regulator, we should be just thinking taking a very functional approach to you know, what are the sources of risk, but embedded into the regulatory structure are certain, the current institutional framework, right? The legacy institutions are there. So for some of that to go away, it's going to take some time. But, you know, my advice to innovators would be take the path of least resistance because if you're going to be waiting for regulators to change things, it's going to just takes a lot of time because Writing rules is a very, very difficult, challenging, risky, painful process, and that's not in our DNA to sort of you know go and quickly change rules. So if this is going to go anywhere, there are also pro the real problems that we all agree exist in the marketplace, and the uh, what happens after the trade is a huge, huge thing. Uh, and so there are these real problems that need to be solved, and my sense is that a lot of these things can be solved without even waiting for the regulator to sort of change regulations. So my money will be on innovators who take the path of least resistance and don't necessarily wait for regulations to change. Brad, you want to respond? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my three and I'll, and I'll add to that. Um, I, if, if I think back to, uh, to both eBay and PayPal and um, how difficult it is to change behavior in payments. So payments is regulated. PayPal, though, broke through. PayPal's, you know, went into the payment um, and innovated in the payment space because there was need. And eBay um, was a new marketplace. It, it was facilitated and enabled by the Internet technology. And it really is, you know, the, the globalization of, of swap meets and garage sales, so not very sexy, and it's very simple. So that, that kind of supports the it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out of something very simple. The technology will be applied to something simple, but everyone understands, and you get the network's effect. So eBay at its core had Google coming out of Yahoo, and, and by the way, Yahoo Japan is, is eBay because eBay went there second and couldn't overcome the network's effects. So I think um, wherever you can get the flywheel going of network's effects, whoever gets that started, it's, it's almost unstoppable, and that creates a big winner. So we should watch that. Um, but you need need. So it's, it's uh, PayPal. There was no one that was going to give merchants who were selling on, on eBay credit. So they were below. This is kind of this notion of there's, there's a need. There's an unbanked. There's a, um, so PayPal um, filled that need, and, um, and, and that's all that happened. You can see PayPal struggling, though, today. So PayPal is struggling going beyond the original need, and it's trying to, you know, crack into the, um, the, the, the store um, environment. It became the payment mechanism, a pretty decent one on the web, but it really hasn't cracked into the physical space, and I, and I predict it's going gonna, it's gonna to have problems because there's no need. We, we can pay when we go to a store. We know how to pay, so we have to change our behavior. So I think there's something that's going to come out of here. So that's one. The other one is, is Commerce One. Look at Commerce One. 
and I think R3, you guys have to take a page, look at that one. So Commerce One was going to be the marketplace for the auto industry. So the big three came together, and and really, um, you know, they, it was very complex. It was a hard build, and everyone needed every little widget, you know, to work for them, and it came crashing down. It had a, you know, great valuation, and then it, it, it got wiped out. And a lot of what Commerce One was spec to do, eBay does today. And it built up from simple things to trading Beanie Babies to today, most a lot of earth moving equipment, a lot of um, restaurant um, equipment, because restaurants go out of business a lot. Um, all that stuff has a life longer than that. It gets traded on eBay. It's so complex things get treated on eBay because they built the functionality over time, not came together as a consortium and built a very complex system. So I think you have to watch for complex systems with complex entities. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a very tough thing to pull off. And then the, um, the other one is, is the Java Fund. So the Java Fund came up, it was a billion dollars. So that's an interesting figure. Wherever there's a billion dollars of, of intent from VCs, um, the Java Fund was to create a competing platform, technology platform to Microsoft. And it was really successful in the, the um, age of the web, and it was right around the time um, it came out of Sun Microsystems. So it came out of an existing technology provider and it, um, it was really to challenge, um, you know, incumbent technology stack that Microsoft was looking quite monopolistic. So that would be my second one that, that I think, um, I think what is, where VCs place a billion dollars of, of bets, something is going to happen um, coming out of that. So I, th I believe that, that this will create a tremendous amount of, um, of interesting things. And the last one may be the simplest, if you can't figure it out, can't figure out where this technology is going to get applied. Look where there's mainframes still, <laughs> and mainframes um, are um, going to be replaced. So, but mainframes are also a sign of huge value because if someone took the time to build a system um, in the days of the mainframe, there was great value because you had to overcome an incredible ROI hurdle to justify putting in a mainframe. And if you still can justify paying the, the license fees that Microsoft, excuse me, that IBM charges you, that's an incredible um, pool of value because it is exorbitantly expensive compared to the technology you can replace it with. So I would say, if you can't figure out where to invest, invest where you're gonna be replacing mainframes in 10 years and you'll be successful. My, my brother-in-law works for Social Security and he was telling me that one of the challenges they have in IT is that they run a batch system on COBOL, and That's young, financial services, young, people, young people graduate with expertise in computer science, don't know COBOL, and have to be taught COBOL by the Social Security Administration so they can operate their system. So I look forward to the distributed ledger on Social Security. I've got half the people, more than half the people who work for us right now didn't go to college before email. ATMs, I mean, they can't conceive of the idea that you can't pay for something over your mobile phone. They like laugh at the old guy, I didn't think right. I was that old. Um, three different things that, that'll make the difference. The first one is the best technology. And I, I think it's important here to maybe clarify the perception that R3 is building our own technology and it's, we're competing and it's our, our way or the other way. It's actually not at all. Our strategy is adopt, adapt, or build. If someone else, if it's a chain or a ripple or a symbiont or an Ethereum comes up with the best solution, we're in. We don't care. Um, we're in the Linux Open Source Foundation. We're going to be announcing our own Open Source Foundation. We're perfectly in, comfortable with and happy. Frankly, it would be easier on us if the organic, the sort of bottom-up technology bubbled up and was fit for purpose. We're absolutely all in on that. We haven't made a decision to only go with our technology. So the best technology, I, I definitely believe, wins. The second thing is, um, I think it'll be driven a, a large part by which industry adopts it first. Um, you know, people have mentioned car payments. They've mentioned health care. Um, I think Perry mentioned, uh, you know, health care uh, conversations they were having. If it turns out another industry adapts blockchain before financial services and they take it one way, they will likely lead the way in ways that others will follow. And that's key to solving a problem. 
It's not just thinking this is neat technology and building it and then looking for a problem to solve. If someone out there sees an opportunity to build something better than what currently exists, and mainframes may well be that, follow that, follow that track, because that's, I think, going to be very telling in terms of how this is adopted. And the final thing is, yeah, it goes to the next panel is regulations. Um, I'm biased because I was at the CFTC, but the CFTC here, which I think is arguably the most flexible and sort of innovative regulator in Washington, just said, don't wait because it's going to take us a while. So um, that's a huge gating factor to any potential technology. Um, that'll also, by the way, play into the, the top one, the industry. I would say those industries that are under less burdensome regulation will have the ability to adapt these technologies in a, in, in a faster and more robust way. And then the rest of us will be trying to figure out how they're doing it as the technology leaves the station. Terry, do you want to uh, – we've had some pretty good summing up in the last few minutes. Do you want to add anything in summing up before we take a break? Sure. It's just that – look, I think what we've um, kind of learned over the past hour is that, you know, permission blockchain technology is – Terrific! Um, it's it's going to I think it really increase the efficiency of the financial uh, operations that exist today, the back office operations. It's terrific. I think there are going to be fewer regulatory questions there because it's simply adopting a new technology to an existing uh, problem. The real regulatory challenges are going to be with uh, how do we um, uh, 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 har you know harness the innovative potential, the social welfare potential of a open, global, permissionless network uh, while mitigating the risks that are inherent in such an open, global, uh, permissionless network. And so to me, um, that's where the real action is. And the questions there, which we'll get to, I'm sure, in the next uh, session, have to do with anti-money laundering and terrorist financing, have to do with consumer protection, and have to do with access to banking, uh, by the way, which the access to banking question, I think, um, companies have a hard time getting banks because uh, bank accounts because the banks see risk related to consumer protection and anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. Uh, so we have to solve those questions, and it's not insurmountable. And it can be done while mitigating the risks and allowing innovation to flourish. Okay. I think that's a great way to tee up the questions we want to talk about after the break. It's 10.15. Why don't we take a 15-minute break and reassemble at 10.30, and we'll have uh, um, uh, the people who have more experience on the regulatory side, in addition to three, talk a little bit about how they see things. So thank you.